Dr. Denton, what was your motivation for writing Evolution, A Theory in Crisis? Very simply, I think the current Darwinian picture is insufficient. I don't think it gives a credible and comprehensive explanation of how the pattern of life on Earth emerged. And um, I think that it's a perfectly normal and ordinary response that when you think something isn't right, you attempt to refute that, that body of doctrine or whatever it is. I mean, it was basically because I felt that the theory was incomplete and didn't give a good explanation of, of uh, all biological phenomena that I was motivated to write the book. What have been the major objections to your book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis? Most of the objections have been um, uh, vague and philosophical. I mean, of the many reviews that I've read very carefully, and that I've looked for specific objections, um, I don't find many specific objections. I mean, most of the objections are that, in fact, uh, this guy's a creationist, or uh, he doesn't believe in Darwinism. Uh, he's uh, he's um, sort of uh, outside of the mainstream of biology, uh, and so forth. They're not the the problems that I have with evolutionary biology, particularly the Darwinian model of evolution, and the ones that I describe in the book. I mean, most of those specific problems, and some of them, of course, which have been aired by many authors over the last century, they were, are not really addressed. The attack is mainly. Um, of a philosophical and non-specific type of nature. Does Darwinian theory adequately explain the pervasive patterns of natural history? Well, the basic pattern it fails to explain is the, or the apparent um, uniqueness and isolation of the major types of organism. Um, my fundamental problem with the theory, I have a number, but perhaps my major one is that, in fact, there are so many highly complicated organs, systems, and structures from the, the nature of the, the lung of a bird, uh, the nature of the, the eye of the rock, rock, rock lobster, and one can mention many, many cases like this, where there are structures, systems, adaptive phenomena in nature of such a nature, of such, such exquisite complexity, um, watch-like systems, if you want, for which I can... I cannot conceive how these things could have come about in terms of a gradual accumulation of random changes. I mean, it strikes me as being a flagrant sort of a denial of common sense to swallow that all these sorts of things were built up by these, by cumulative small random changes. I think that, in fact, something, uh, some, something within me, you know, my judgment is that in terms of deep common sense, this is simply a nonsensical claim, and especially when for the, in the great majority of cases, most of the complex adaptation, nobody can think of any credible explanation of how they came about. And this is a very profound question, which everybody skirts, everybody brushes over, everybody tries to sweep under the carpets. The fact is that the majority of these complex adaptations in nature cannot be adequately explained by, by a, that, their, 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 that their emergence occurred by a series of intermediate forms. Um, and this is, in fact, something which, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, this is a fundamental problem. And uh, the fact that there are so many of these things, for me, okay, there's something wrong with the theory. Common sense tells me there must be something wrong. Is it possible that random mutations and natural processes are insufficient to account for all biological information? I just don't think it's credible that the accumulation of small fortuitous changes can lead to certain of the most complex adaptations we see in living things. I don't think the transformations, for instance, during vertebrate evolution um, uh, of the various gill arches from fish to mammal, I found that that sort of level of transformation generated by small random changes quite incredible. I find highly complicated adaptations for which nobody has ever imagined the intermediates in reality existing. I find that, in fact, in those cases, again, I find it incredible. I think that, in fact, basically, I do not believe that, 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 that common sense allows you to believe it, as it were. And I think that, in fact, if you were a Martian and you came from Mars and you were shown a thing like the avian lung and, uh, and you said, well, how, how did this come about on Earth? And uh, the, an orthodox biologist came along and said, well, uh, basically what happened was 
that uh, reptiles underwent, as all organisms do, slight changes. And slowly, for some, in some way, the, the, the traditional in and out bellows lung was gradually converted to the circulatory lung of the birds. And I think that the Martian would have some <laughs> problem <laughs> first being presented with this explanation for believing it. In fact, he wouldn't believe it. Um, uh, the reason why biologists believe this explanation is because they haven't got another explanation. And uh, there's, there's a saying that, in fact, uh, the intellect abhors a vacuum. But the fact is that that is not the explanation how it happened, and it's incredible. And looked at, um, as it were, from a Martian point of view, it's obviously absurd. And there is no doubt that in the history of life on Earth, that is not how it happened. It did not, wasn't built up gradually by little gradual accumulations. Common sense, sound and prudent judgment based on a simple perception of the situation or facts. Common sense means paying attention to the obvious. A frog turning into a prince, as evolutionists claim, may happen in fairy stories, but our common sense tells us this does not happen in real life. To try to prove their fairy story, evolutionary scientists confuse the issues by interchanging fact, imagination, and belief without making any clear distinctions between the three. Scientists need to understand they are not the keepers of all knowledge. There are phenomena that exist and function in our world that science cannot explain. Rather than accepting their limitations, some scientists disparage people who for good reasons see the world differently. This unscientific attitude is not constructive and hinders the advancement of knowledge. Scientists need to be intellectually honest and say, I don't know, rather than accept a theory that is not supported by the facts or common sense. Science should not be wasting resources trying to find a non-existent scientific explanation for life's origin, but rather be about studying and understanding the workings of God's creation. It takes a lot of rationalization and denial of the obvious to try to disprove God and his creative acts. The facts and common sense support the explanation that life was created by God. This truth will ultimately prevail as well as all of God's truth as revealed in the Bible. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Philippians 2 9 to 11